on today's episode of Hidden History. I admittedly am going to do even less of my own work than usual because it is a bonus episode this Thursday, but probably one of the most controversial attempts and one of the most well-known attempts of a major mainstream media outlet to do quote-unquote hidden history or uncover hidden history was the 1619 Project, specifically for the claims it made around the American Revolution and the founding of the country. And that got me thinking. The 1619 Project has kind of really been on the back burner of my political mind for a long time because it's faced some serious criticism from people I respect. And I read it, and I kind of thought it was pretty good in the first place. So where do I stand? Where should you stand? You know, I'm going to try and cut through all the noise about the 1619 Project because, you know, if you're anything like me, you're looking at a lot of these, uh, you know, you're not a historian. You're looking at um, you're looking at a lot of different things like, um, you know, uh, you're looking at a lot of diff- different things on like conservative media, looking at a lot of things on leftist centrist media. Um, and they're both kind of, you know, both people that you don't or you're not entirely uh, inclined to agree with. Um, to be, you know, quite honest, like I'm, I'm not, you know, really predisposed to taking anything the Atlantic says with a hundred percent. You know, I'd like to take it with a grain of salt, just as much as you know. No, actually, you know, with I would take skepticism from like Fox News about the 1619 Project with actually quite a bit more uh, salt. To uh, be quite honest with you, but you know, I think there are some real fair critiques that I've heard over time, and just really what this episode is about is uh, kind of trying to put. The 1619 Project, finally, at long last, in two, you know, two years late, much ado later, uh, kind of into a appropriate historical context, kind of coming to terms with what it means and how we should process it in the first place, because it has some very interesting connections to, to today. And I think probably the best person to do that is the, I think, Jacobin historian, uh, University of Princeton professor, who r- r- writes a wonderful, wonderful essay about this in Harper's um, this was written, I'm not exactly sure when it was written, it's on, I think, yeah, from July 2021, uh, the 2021 issue, um, The History Wars, um, so, 19, so 1619-7076 and the fight to control the past, this is uh, from Matthew Carp. Um, so, last spring, he writes, the uh, 155 years after the fall of Richmond, the Confederate capital surrendered again. In April 1865, the capitulation was swift and almost outlandishly theatrical. After learning that Robert E. Lee's army had withdrawn from Petersburg, the Confederate President Jefferson Davis and his military guard escaped south under the cover of darkness, setting half the city on fire as they fled. Early the next morning, the first Union troops arrived, and as Richmond's black residents celebrated in the streets, joined by more than a few poor whites, I think, you know, that part of the 1619 Project, the, the, the relationship, the economic relationship that a lot of people, um, you know, on a lot of white people had to a lot of black people and how that economic relationship was fundamentally went unrealized due to external circumstances, mainly from kind of our capital and things like that. Uh, I think that is a, a big hole in, in their kind of historical analysis, I can just say, right off the bat. Um, but... He really kind of pointedly puts here, the embers of the regime dedicated to preserving African slavery were extinguished by hundreds of former slaves. The occupying forces then marched to Davis' executive mansion and commandeered it as their headquarters. The second fall of Richmond was hardly kinder to Confederate president, pretty much talking about in June of 2020 when they took all the statues down. Um... The conquest from Monument Avenue represented a key front in the renewed struggle for racial justice. The demand for dramatic thinking of U.S. history and its place in public life, strikingly the powerful energy behind this fight, comes not only from scholars, but from activists, journalists, and other thinkers who have made history a new kind of political priority. Although American historical amnesia is very, very common, as Gore Vidal said, we learn nothing because we remember nothing. Liberals today are more committed than ever to a passionate remembrance of things past. 
In recent years, a distinct pattern has emerged. Acts of horror, the killings of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, the Charleston Church Massacre, the deadly Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, the murder of George Floyd, the storming of the U.S. Capitol. They really, I think, and this is you know the fundamental lack of politics as a force of change and how that is, you know, has kind of fundamentally been taken away from people and they really just don't know what to do about it. Their biggest response is, and the biggest kind of liberal response is, distributing things like reading lists, syllabi, you know, anytime, you know, you, you probably saw all the reading lists, the anti-racist reading lists popping up on Instagram stories, the statues being taken down. And to me, more than anything, that was just an expression of real powerlessness, an expression that, you know, in, when it really comes down to it, that people really recognize a problem, but in so many ways, um, really feel like they just can't move the needle on anything productive. You know, they can't think of anything to do uh, that would be productive. So I think that energy really is just kind of manifesting itself in things like, uh, you know, reading Ibram X. Kendi and kind of, uh, you know, as a way to soothe your anger about the current situation and kind of feel like you're doing something. So every modern political movement makes some contact with history. And even the United States, when our notoriously weak historical memory has been uh, very much on display and very much idealized historical memory, um, progressive reformers, for one, have always invoked historical struggles. Eugene Debs compared the socialists of 1908 to the abolitionists of 1858, and I think probably one of the more dishonest critiques of uh, people like uh, of the 1690 Project went kind of along the lines of, you know, Martin Luther King, Frederick Douglass, they all respected and, lo- and praised the Declaration of Independence. They praised the Declaration of Independence because, you know, or talked about the Declaration of Independence, I should say, uh, only as a, you know, a mirror almost to hold up to Americans uh, in American culture and American society's face to say like the the clear and blatant hypocrisy there, which I think is something that the critics who say that, for example, what I was reading in the uh, World Socialist website, have just been completely and totally kind of ignored, uh, to say the least. Um, yet the role of history today, especially within liberal discourse, has changed. Rather than mine for the past for usable politics, whether As an analog, inspiration, or warning, thinkers now travel in the opposite direction from present injustice to historical crime. Current American inequalities, many liberals insist, must be addressed through encounters with the past. Programs of reform or redistribution, no matter how ambitious, can hope to succeed only after the country goes a profound reckoning, uh, to use the keywords of the day, with centuries of racial oppression. And the question is, what does that reckoning look like? What does that look like and for what the past two years what we've seen is just very much you know uh elites in liberal circles kind of doing this uh, very much self-flagellation about like white privilege and power contracts and things like that all while kind of poo-pooing any kind of real substantial material reform so in the age of sanders and trump um i think uh we have seen a, a very interesting interesting situation so I mean, we, we like the the New York Times, for example, as I'm sure you remember, and they're during their editorial board meeting about who they were going to endorse. Uh, they for the Democratic nomination, um, they could really not muster more than one vote out of thirty for Bernie Sanders, and you know, definitely the most ambitious, most you know, racial or not not necessarily racial, but the candidate who would most want to pr- like bring about a material reckoning. Um, but uh, in the past few years, published the 1619 Project, which, which was billed as the most expansion, uh, ambitious ex- examination of the legacy of slavery that has ever been undertaken in an American newspaper, an essay making a case for reparations, an excerpt adapted from Isabel Wilkerson's cast, which compared uh, America's enduring racial hierarchy to those of India and Nazi Germany. In the age of Sanders and Trump, the Democratic establishment has assumed a defensive posture concerned about withholding all of the various barbarians at the gate, and, and the emphasis there on all of the barbarians at the gate. And yet, in its consideration of the past, the same establishment has somehow grown large and courageous, suddenly eager for a galloping revision of American history. For some left-wing skeptics, this apparent paradox requires little investigation. It redirects real anger towards vague and symbolic grievances. 
No, the Democrats who govern Virginia will not repeal the state's anti-union right to work law. But yes, by all means, they will make Juneteenth an official holiday. If this movement only signals a shift from material demands to metaphysical reckonings from the movement politics to elite cultural war, this is not an advance, but a significant retreat. This critique, however, persuasive as a reading of many liberal politicians, does not do justice to the intellectuals and journalists who have driven the national debate on these issues. It does not capture the significance of their interventions or the ambition of their challenge to traditional liberal ideas, nor does it capture the peculiarity of today's politics of history. And really, the unkind of precedented way, I think, what is what Matt Carp's saying is, like, politics and history, um, they've always been prevalent, but, you know, much more about drawing inspiration from the future, not using it as a tool to, like, kind of shame people today, I, I, I feel like. Um, so, the pretty much... The American conservatives, traditionally attracted to history as an exercise of patrimonial devotion, have at the time of Trump abandoned many of their old pieties, instead oscillating between incoherence and outright nihilism. Liberals, meanwhile, seem to expect more from the past than ever before, leaving behind the end of history, we have arrived at something like history as end. The second fall of Richmond, talking about the Confederate statues going down, marked not only a victory for the BLM protesters, but a real and significant withdrawal from the lore of the Confederacy, even in ideological precincts where the lore has reigned for more than a century, which I think really was significant. If you're looking at the two biggest changes of the Black Lives Matter movement, like I think you see a real desire and a real like actual acceptance that Police misconduct ha- has to be punished now, which is a very significant. Look at what the Kim Potter case, BLM. I think if BLM hadn't happened, uh, she would still be employed today. Um, and this, this kind of real final shattering of the kind of Confederate myth, the Confederate lore, has been really, really significant. Republicans in, in the Mississippi state legislature voted overwhelmingly to remove the Confederate battle emblem from the state flag. NASCAR broke long-standing tradition and banned the Rebel banner from its events, and the pages of right-wing journals such as the National Review and the Federalist, often stout defenders of Confederate moder- monuments, now overflowed with conservative authors either questioning or rejecting these symbols. This is, I think, a significant kind of cultural shift, but, you know, is it, you know, well, I, I do want to kind of get into its real lasting consequence. Um, and you know this. Let's talking talking about this change here. Um, so it is. It was not always thus. Barely two decades ago, you know, flashback to a South Carolina debate. George W. Bush defended the state's right to fly the Confederate battle flag, winning hoots of approval from the audience. Bush's first Attorney General John Ashcroft stirred a controversy by celebrating quote Southern patriots such as Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson. Uh, while his first Secretary of the Interior, Gail Norton, lamented that advocates of state sovereignty had lost too much when the Confederacy was defeated. In contrast, leadership of today's American right, from congressional Republicans to Tucker Carlson, have pretty much used the monuments to not defend the traditional virtues of the Confederate lost cause, you know, the patriotism, the sacrifice, all those vague terms that meant kind of upholding a society based pretty much solely on the exploitation and enslavement of black people, um, but to announce related attacks on national figures like George Washington, Ulysses S. Grant, and Teddy Roosevelt. And I think that is, you know, going back to the liberal side here, that just shows you the kind of hysteria, especially in the like the later stages of the Black Lives Matter protest phase that really kind of happened. Because you know, you're looking at Teddy Roosevelt, you're like just trying to take frantically look at taking every statue that you could possibly see. And I mean, to a certain extent, that's not really, I, I guess, their fault or some sort of kind of malicious intent. It's really, I mean, if you're looking at, you know, establishment figures, it, it much more is their fault. But, you know, it's hard to blame, I guess, protesters and people for kind of reacting this way uh, when, you know, what in the hell else are they going to do? Uh, it, this is a trumpet blast of retreat, whether liberal commentators have acknowledged it or not. Uh, it is a yeah, I've seen, I think very significant to you know cultural shifts and like gay rights things like that. That has really changed. Um, Donald Trump occasionally celebrates the Confederacy, but the president's 
fitful former president fitful bouts of nostalgia had little effect on policy. When his own Department of Defense moved to bar the Confederate flags from military property, Trump did not countermand the order. Last summer, Trump loudly opposed a provision in the National Defense Authorization Act mandating the removal of all Confederate names from military property, but his veto was overridden with commanding bipartisan support in both houses of Congress. The White House's more substantial attempts to develop a politics of history, uh, if they merit such a name, followed the same pattern. As many critics have observed, the so-called 70, 70, 1776 Commission, which was kind of a last gasp of a very much incredibly just weak and joke administration, convening the, dying, yeah, convening the dying days of the Trump administration, was a very slapdash affair, like so much of the, the Trump administration was and the right is now. Um Organized as a last-ditch effort to refute progressive narratives of history, the commission's hastily produced a report consulted no professional story and cited no historical scholarship and recycled huge swaths of text from authors' prior publications. Um, yeah. And probably with the most notable thing about this whole situation is even when 7076 comes out with their whole position here, they're still praising Reconstruction, which, by the way, was something I saw very laughably attacked recently in uh, a magazine, The American Conservative, um, pr- um, they really, like, like, the Civil War in the past, it's, like, been a very, very much a major, like, salvo for the culture wars, you know, all, going all the way back to the Clinton administration, uh, Carl Pride's here. But, yeah, the report's authors, they praised Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Reconstruction, and called the South Ascent into Jim Crow a system hardly better than slavery, which, you know... <laughs> As true as that is, and as like as very basic as it should be, uh, it is still a retreat from previous Republican positions. Um, the report's getting recognition that slavery was the cause of the Civil War and emancipation was its result. Issuing hoary tropes about a brother's war may well represent an advance from the sentimental politics of Ken Burns' famous documentary series. This should not go unnoticed. Um, so, pretty much like... The best right-wing historian at this moment is uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who has to kind of do the voodoo magic of saying, uh, um, who like pretty much like, Dinesh D'Souza, pretty much who says like, quote, unlike earlier generations, the Confederacy makes no effort to defend or even contextual or, or sorry, conservatives makes no effort to defend or even contextualize slavery, the Confederacy, or Jim Crow. States' rights play little part in his historical narrative, but pretty much his big thing is saying that the Democrats were really all part of the responsibility for slavery just attempting to pretty much get his viewers or his readers who are pretty much have the conservative brain worms of today to be like oh democrats were responsible for slavery you know we we republicans were fighting against slavery you know did not just comp- having the the most basic possible level of understanding about the history of like our two-party structure the values the um ideological basis for the parties just didn't really exist like you had democrats supporting slavery uh you know up until you know the 1960s uh which alongside people who were like joe biden and you know other type of senators who while they were still incredibly you know had very backward views in my opinion and they still do um were not you know rampant supporters of segregation like if you look at some of those james o easling quotes like you know biden got in trouble for like praising him uh in the primaries but um, he was not saying things like, you know, any black guy comes around, you have the right to shoot him or something like James O. Eastland was saying. Um, really kind of crazy, crazy stuff. Um, only conservative Republicans from Lincoln to Trump, he pauses here, have faithfully defended American freedom and civil rights. Drawing the straightest of historical lines right there. Um, left-leaning historians, myself included, this is carp writing, have sometimes been tempted to debate this argument whose claims are easily reduced to rubble. But this is a fool's errand since D'Souza's stick is immune to facts, logic, and frankly indifferent to ideological consistency. You could even say that the D'Souza thesis, which is uh, just saying with a flashlight under your face, did you know the Democratic Party defended slavery, the Civil War, founded the KKK, and fought against every major civil rights act in U.S. history? All right, I shouldn't have said that. But uh, <laughs> So look, look, that's a, my, my best uh, Dinesh impression there um this this sort of trolling offers pretty much no ideological counterblast uh to the progressive narrative that puts slavery and racial oppression at the center of the american experience but you know he probably has to tap his viewers on the shoulder once in a while and be like you know the democrats were the bad guys not the good guys you know that was you know but 
culture has changed a bit. So it's it's very, very interesting. Ultimately, the smirking vision of history cannot inspire meaningful conviction. It, it Its emergence reflects a uh, rising breed of right-wing politics that, for all its bluster, does not really trouble itself with America's past in the first place. Um, Trump, after all, can barely remember who his when his supposed heroes uh, <laughs> were alive. He he once said that uh, Andrew Jackson, who again died in 1845, was very angry uh, with what was happening with regard to the Civil War. <laughs> the macho nationalism appeals to the American world are really just about kind of waving the American flag, talking about these vague ideals, and not really like going that much deeper. I think a really kind of pitch perfect example of this is at the Trump National Golf Club in Virginia, uh, where, that uh, Carl Pecano writes about here, uh, where there was a plaque inscribed with Trump's name that commemorates, of course, it had Trump's name on it, <laughs> that commemorates a gruesome battle. Uh, Many great American soldiers, both of the North and South, died at this spot. The casualties were so great that the water would turn red, and thus became this became known as the River of Blood. This battle never happened. In 2015, a reporter from the New York Times informed Trump that historians regarded that plaque as a fabrication. And he responded, how would they know that? Were they there? Brings up a good point. Uh, today, it's not only conservatives, really, or not conservatives, but liberals who are most sincerely committed to American history. Yet they too have evolved, perhaps even more dramatically, from their ideological forebears. Famous liberal historians like Thomas Babington Macaulay to James McPherson are famous for kind of baseline optimism expressed in complex accounts of contested and contingent events that ultimately lead to progress. Pretty much the, 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 the moral arc of history is long, but it bends to, to, to uh, progress and things like that. Um, in lesser hands, the liberal narrative can slide towards complacency or worse, the construction of American story in which each act of brutality uh, somehow sets the stage for the triumph advance to come. Uh, for example, like colonization, colonization would lead to nationhood, slavery would lead to emancipation, and Jim Crow to civil rights. You know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, that kind of a thing. This has been the rhetorical train of Democratic presidents since John F. Kennedy, a happy realm where confessed historical crimes painlessly resolve into patriotic triumphs. There is nothing wrong with America, Bill Clinton intoned during his uh, first inaugural address, that cannot be cured with what is right with America. I think that is a very great encapsulation of the liberal view of history that like, has been so prevalent for so long. It was kind of Will McAvoy, West Wing, uh, you know, uh, we're not the greatest country in the world, but we can't be, that kind of thing. Um, you know, <laughs> the uh, that really does represent I mean, a big reason why so many people in the, um, you know, liberals, or kind of a traditional liberals, I guess you could say, uh, were a bit taken aback, and I really think of my, pers- my own father about this, um, by the 1619 project was because it represented such a market shift from that kind of, you know, the, the we're always going to be on the right track because we have these great constitutional values, yada, 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 yada. Um, but today's historicist critique operates with a different kind of cosmology. In her essay introducing the 1619 project, journalist Nicole Hannah Jones notes that black Americans have fought for and achieved astounding progress, not only for themselves, but for all Americans. Yet the project does not really explore this compelling story, yet it largely skips over the anti-slavery moment, the Civil War, and the Civil Rights era. Strikingly, Frederick Douglass appears more often in the 1776 report than the 1619 project, where he really receives only two brief mentions, both in an essay by Wesley Morris on black music. MLK, for his part, makes only one appearance in the 69 Project, the same number as Martin Shkreli. In more than 100 pages of print, we read very few uh, about major advocates of abolition or labor or civil rights from Harriet Tubman. Um, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Henry Highland Garrett, A. Philip Randolph, Ella Baker, Rosa Parks, and Bayard Rustin are a few of those who go unmentioned. Two fundamental themes anchor the 1690 Project's uh, approach to these American history, origins and continuity. The table of contents is a fusillade of facts that have emerged in unbroken lines from centuries of persecution. Whether the subject is Atlanta traffic, sugar consumption, mass incarceration, the wealth gap, weak labor protections, or the power of Wall Street, the burden of arguments remains the same. To trace the deep continuities of slavery, Jim Crow, and racial justice to today. Why doesn't the United States have universal health care? The answer begins with policies and active after the Civil War, one essay posits, American democracy have never shed 
an undemocratic assumption um, has never set shed an undemocratic assumption present present at its founding that some people are inherently more entitled to power than others. And the question is, how much? I I really think, like looking at this, and I think a big, you know the big re- they're like trying to figure out why America doesn't have universal health care and looking at the structure of the country and the history of it. I think is very very instructive and a good thing to do. Um, but you know, thinking about it, you know, it's just because they like specifically like hated black people and not, not because a large, like powerful coalition of people that developed after the civil war, um, you know, in kind of the Republican party and the, and the democratic party and the gilded age and stuff like that accumulated and set up a system where it would be much, much more, uh, beneficial to them and the expansion of the country to not do things like universal health care and not give power and not distribute wealth to uh, ordinary people. Um, yeah, so American democracy is never should yet. Yeah, that is that's that's that quote there. Um, the wheel of history spins and spins, but doesn't exactly move, uh, which I think is a really kind of interesting way of kind of summing up the whole thing. Almost like we are kind of on one s- straight line, hard to kind of arrest and the th- sins that we have almost can never really be, although it's often mentioned, fully reckoned with. Above all, the historical imagination of the 1619 Project centers on a single moment, the purported date that marks the arrival of African slaves into British North America. This is sometimes referred to as the country's original sin, writes Jake Silverstein, editor of the New York Times Magazine, but it's more than that. It's the country's very origin. Out of this moment, he continues, grew nearly everything that's made America exceptional. The kernel of 400 years of economic, political, and cultural life. History, in this conception, is not a jagged chronicle of events, struggles, and transformation. It's the blossoming of planted seeds and the flourishing of a foundational premise that was there from all the way back in 1619. The dominant images here are biblical and biological. Slavery's original racism as part of America's DNA, the 1619 Project, contains no fewer than seven such references. Uh, these marks are indelible, key highlighting word, these are indelible, and they stem from birth. The existence of slavery and racism means that America has been, quote, stamped from the beginning, as Kennedy titles his first book, initially borrowing a phrase from Jefferson Davis, uh, just as init- as DNA is the code for the instructions of cell development, writes Wilkerson, caste is the operating system for economic, political, and social interactions in the United States from time of its gestation. From happy cures and bending arcs to tainted natures and embedded genetic codes, the metaphorical distance between old liberal history and new dispensation is immense. Since its publication, 1619 Project has attracted criticism from pretty much every ideological quarter. On the right, it's become a soft target for politicians in search of a culture war, a handful of Republican legislatures even proposing bills Barring the uh, project from classrooms, a clear violation of free speech. On the left, the Trotskyist World Socialist websites uh, denounced it as a reactionary, race-based falsification of American and world history. Um, you know, I think the, it's, I think I read that before I started this show. I think it is a little bit harsh and doesn't really kind of look at their um, accusations or you know, it doesn't really look at their claims on the best of faith in 1619 Project, but. In terms of the kind of overemphasis on on race, and I think you know the in, like s- dynamics, I guess that it presents. Although you know, race obviously certainly being a factor, I think more used as a tool to kind of drive a wedge between you know very normally uh, and race and racism used as a tool to kind of keep. Uh, kind of black people in their place and poor white people in their place, but their poor white people's place just happen to be very much higher than the uh, black people's place uh, in a way that benefited rich white people in both the North and the South. Um, So the Communist USA Party, CPUSA, has defended the project, but in some ways it's long-term, long-tenured champions of liberal history who had fought it much more freely. Uh, McPherson, Sean Willens, and three other scholars of American history have challenged several of the project claims, in particular the way that Hannah Jones portrayed the link between slavery and the American Revolution, which is very interesting to me. And also very interesting that she and um, I think the New York Times project in general pretty much had to come out and issue a critique or a very kind of slight correction where they said some of the colonist motivations for um, departing from the uh, British 
empire was to preserve slavery, which I think is much more accurate and kind of represents a, a real key area where they're both wrong. Because I think fundamentally, if you look at the, the nation, and it really is the kind of a big source of the political, um, like the kind of foundational part of American politics, is because America really, especially in the 13 colonies, wasn't really a coherent unit. It wasn't um, one colony. It was 13 separate colonies. It was different economic interests. It was that, And that's what, really why the Constitution was so... Um, was kind of fu- funded in the way it is, because or formed in the way it is. Because a lot of other revolutions, you have really the people who are driving it are not the ruling class, because the ruling class are being overthrown. But... The, this American colonial ruling class that had formed in the period of the American colonization was much more intent on casting off the British ruling class because pretty much they thought they could do a better job. But the thing they really did kind of fail to understand was because is because um, was be- the fact that their interests were very much different, and I, you know, there are some people who are definitely very much benefited from wanting to defend slavery, and some people who wanted to leave the colonies because they wanted to, you know, get tea easier. I don't know. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Britain, so pretty much the, the claim here again is Britain has g- grown deeply conflicted about slavery by 1776, cutting ties with the empire. America's founders aimed to ensure that slavery would continue. And one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare, uh, or some of the colonists, she later added, uh, decided to declare their independence from Britain was because of their uh, because they wanted to, to protect the institution of slavery. So, while Lentz and other critics argued that the fundamentally this fundamentally misrepresented the politics of the revolution. As historians from Eric Williams to Christopher Brown have insla- explained in detail, anti-slavery sentiment in Britain remained marginal in the 1770s. Certainly, it was much weaker in London than in the rebellious colonies, where um, colonial assemblies had already attempted to end the importation of enslaved Africans, so it's kind of hard to really make that case if you have people in London still kind of supporting slavery, a huge or, or significant chunk of them, and you also have these kind of colonial legislatures trying to end the importation of enslaved Africans, uh, and the Continental Congress would ban the slave trade in 1774. As a scholar, Leslie Harris put it bluntly in Politico, the protection of slavery was not one of the thir- main reasons the 13 colonies went to war, so pretty much eh, false. Uh, Harris, who had been contacted as a fact checker uh, with the New York Times, uh, wrote that she'd vigorously disputed Hannah Jones' incorrect statement and was dist- distressed to see that it had been made in, made it into print. Eventually, the Times issued a thin clarification, agreeing to change the phrase "the colonists decided" to "some of the colonists decided." Um, but later, editors pretty much had to deflate some of the most forceful language of the project, eliminating the phrase about 1619 as our true founding. Another sentence describing it as the uh, moment America began. For some critics, this was a real embarrassment, but Silverstein insisted he had not really made any concessions. Um, you know, not a surprise. But I'm, I really think there are, like, if you're looking at this situation, it's just, you know, he's wrong. <laughs> like, the the uh, it's just simply not one of the main reasons and was not, a, you know, for for a large enough portion of the people actually doing the founding or and doing the split for I think that to be accurate. I think a really, really interesting point is made here as cited by Carp, uh, made by Adam Sir Surwer in the Atlantic. So he writes a fun um uh it's not he has written it's this this disagreement here is not only about facts, but the politics of the metaphor. A fundamental disagreement over the trajectory of American society in a country that is now wealthier in a society than uh, than any society in human history, but which still groans under the most grotesque inequalities in the developed world, from health care to housing to criminal justice and every other dimension of social life. I mean, the liberal narrative of, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, like, we're always going to be getting better and better and better because we really are, you know, the best country found on the best values and all that stuff, you know, people just fundamentally are not buying that anymore. I mean, some commentators have rushed to declare Joe Biden a transformational president on the basis of his large stimulus bill, but this was written in July 2021. That stimulus bill is dead in the water and it's a complete joke now. And even still, liberalism really 
And Joe Biden's brand of liberalism remains less notable for what it proposes than what it removes from the horizon. Universal guarantees for health care, jobs, college education, living wage, etc., etc. Although Biden may still invoke Obama's arc of the moral universe on occasion, the metaphors that brought him to power and that still define his political project are not about the glories of progress but the deep need for repair. We must restore the sort of America, he says, in a very kind of common uh, uh, refrain from throughout the campaign. In a country so deeply riven with injustice, with violence and oppression coded into its very DNA, what more could be hoped for? In this sense, all uh, for all their narrative daring, the new cohort of historicists are not only institutionally but ideologically at home with the politics of today's liberal establishment. I think that's a very, very important thing to note here. In the end, that is how I think you got to understand the 1619 Project. As really, as a, you know, the, they kind of get there and really, and really the biggest thing is trying to convince you that they're kind of invested in like larger, bigger structural change, but... Um, these kind of new left figures, such as Coates, Hannah Jones, or Wilkerson, sit not at the margins but near the core of the American cultural elite, writing for the nation's most influential journals, winning some of the most prestigious prizes, and receiving acclaim from its most powerful politicians, from the Senate Majority Leader to the Vice President. In the past five years, Hannah Jones has emerged as an outspoken Twitter critic of Sanders and his left-wing class politics. And that is really what these people are probably the most skeptical of, actually having very kind of like serious analysis, a serious critique of these structures. As we kind of wrap up through uh, this article here, I just want to bring it to another very insightful point made near the end. Um, in order to understand the brutality of American capitalism, uh, one essay in the 1619 Project begins, you have to start on the plantation, not with Goldman Sachs or Shell Oil, the behemoths of the contemporary order, but with the slaveholders of the 17th century. And you may say, you know, well, what's wrong with that? We're going to start at the beginning and look at what happens. But um, such a critique of capitalism quickly becomes a prisoner in its own heredity. heredity. A uh, creative, more creative historical politics would move in the opposite direction, re- recognizing the power, keyword, not to say like, you know, not to say like these these industri- industrial ideals um, and these kind of like exploitative ideals in America didn't necessarily start from um, from that period, and you know, not to say that it wasn't exploitative in any kind of way, but if you want to use history, which I think is the best use for history to understand our current moment and what should and can be done, and kind of a as a Frederick Douglass. Uh, Frederick Douglass had kind of a terrain under our feet, I guess, you, uh, they, um, as he said, they shape uh, they shape our sense of the terrain under our feet and the horizon in front of us. They frame our vision for what is possible. I mean, that time period may not be the best way to look at it. What would it mean when we look at U.S. history to follow William James in seeking the fruit, not the roots? An older tradition of left-wing American politics had much less trouble with his historical think- thinking. Um, so uh, he cites here Douglas' famous speech in the for- about the Fourth of July, and you know what is the Fourth of July to a slave, came at the low ebb of the abolitionist movement just after the Compromise of 1850, which included the Fugitive Slave Act, appearing to remove the question of uh, slavery from national politics for good. That made it all the more important for him to build an argument from history drawing on the experience of the revolution to insist the U.S. belonged not to the timid and the prudent, but to insurgents who preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. I think the best thing that really, um, I think the, the best thing that you could really, really tell on this, and the, to kind of sum it all up, if you're looking at like the broad effect of the, the, the problem of the 1619 Project, is that kind of vision that kind of, okay, but what do we do now next is fundamentally lacking. And it represents a time period in politics where just all kind of faith, hope, um, and just belief in a better world has been fundamentally kind of drained out of us. And the best thing that we can do at this point is to say, you know, we've had a really bad past. It's going to be very, very hard to ignore. And any kind of um, any kind of real material structure based around class first is is wrong because it's just it's not right for the moment or it should be assumed by race or something else so if you look at that i think it's it's probably one of the best ways of uh, kind of going about it today so 
uh, Douglas kind of questioned the w- wisdom of any historical politics that undermined the prospects for present day change. This did not imply a purely instrumental contempt for the past in the manner of the Trumpian right, but reflected a clear eyed determination to treat history not as scripture or DNA, but as a site of struggle. We have to do with the past only uh, what we can make it useful to the present and to the future, Douglas declared, to all inspiring motives, to noble deeds which can be gained from the past, we are welcome. But now it's time, but now is the time, the important time, uh, for, you know, just saying, you know, live in the now, live in the moment. This is really what that comes down to. Uh, for some scholars, this this must mean, um, read like rank presentism, presentism, yet unlike the new religious orig- originalist framing of the 1619 project it gets the order of operations right you know talking about the true utilization of history for politics and the formation of a better world the past may live inside the present but it does not govern our growth as the 1619 project may have you believe however sorted or sublime or origins are not our destinies our daily journey into the future is not fixed by moral, moral arcs or genetic instructions, we must come to see history, as Brown put it, not as what we dwell in are propelled by or determined by, uh, but rather as what we fight over, fight for, and aspire to honor in our practices of justice You know, in the current day. History is not the end. It is, not, it is only one more battleground where we must meet the vast demands of the ever-living now. That is a great essay there by Matt Carp, kind of helping me kind of put this very interesting project and real first major attempt to kind of unveil this new hidden history uh, for um, the issue of slavery. All right. So we got for you today on Hidden History. We will be back next Tuesday and back with Newsflash, end of the year show on Friday.